the day-to-day -day problems of living in tower blocks have been carefully chronicled for more than 20 years. This film is not about those social problems. It's about the growing realisation that many of the blocks were not built properly. As a result, hundreds of them are potentially dangerous and may have to be demolished. This is an inquiry into the origins of that disaster and into how it was allowed to happen. The only answer is more houses. The government are looking to increasing the productivity in the building industry and are basing all their plans during the following five years on reaching and maintaining a level of 400,000 houses a year. With this speech, the then Minister of Housing, Sir Keith Joseph, is generally credited with starting what became known as the numbers game. And here I come to a very strange omission from the socialist proceedings last week. In all their official speeches condemning us and our efforts, in all their official speeches, they never mentioned a target of their own. The Liberals at least disagreed about one. Their conference wanted 500,000 houses, the platform settled for 375,000 houses. But the Labour Party never had an official target at all. That seems very odd for a party that's so sure it can do better. Britain is today being held to ransom by a small but unscrupulous group of land speculators and profiteers who are lining their pockets tax-free at the expense of local councils trying to rehouse overcrowded families and of young couples... The Labour Party rose to the Conservative bait. A crucial part of their 1964 election campaign was the promise to build 500,000 houses a year. Labour won the election and Harold Wilson moved in triumph to Downing Street. He chose as housing minister one of the party's intellectuals, Richard Crossman, who now faced the unenviable task of turning a political promise into reality. Crossman appointed the managing director of Costains, the building contractors, as a special advisor. Together they pinned their hopes on a new and untried method of building. It does, of course, mean factory-built houses, but factory-built houses can be just as good as production line cars. And I think we're going to move to this. The only thing is to make sure that they're done by good architects and well landscaped, and that will get over any danger of monotony. The main thing is you standardize the production. The whole of one wall is done in a single part, and you standardize down to say 20 or 22 parts. And then you put the house together on the site, having bought it, shall we say, by lorry. And once you get the thing going, of course, the factory built, they do come off jolly fast, and that means the local authorities got to get the gas ready, the electricity ready. So you want to realize that although the government made the promises in its election campaigns for 400,000 a year, 500,000 a year, and so forth, it wasn't the government that had to build them, it was the local authorities that had to build them. So the government then put the pressure on the local authorities to take up these systems. And, of course, the government also put pressure on the major building contractor, who didn't need a great deal of pressing. So many that only factory-made floor and wall units of precast concrete can keep pace with the scheduled program. So a new plant... Sensing a huge new stone, market, the contractors new invested millions of pounds in production facilities, floor, often before securing a single firm order. Their confidence was based on the knowledge that the government had introduced a system of subsidies to encourage councils to use industrialised methods and to build as high as possible. The destination is the building site. We'd always hoped that there would be a day when buildings could be more or less made in factories and they're just assembled on the site. So to us, this seemed as though the day had come at last. If the parts could be made in a factory where they would be under control conditions, where you could have proper inspectors, where you could have proper plant, as they did have, and then the only task then remained would be to assemble them on the site. Obviously, this seemed a straightforward thing to do. In the present housing shortage, time is the essence of the contract, and so is money. The sector system Given the size of their investment, the contractors were also concerned with time and money. They sent out special teams of salesmen to travel around Britain. 
Part of their job was to entertain local councillors, usually in the best hotels, whose dining rooms began to enjoy a mini-boom of their own. This hotel, of course, this particular type of room was typical of rooms all over the country, but uh, all of the major contractors and most of the major professions, uh, architects, engineers and surveyors, used to literally travel around every day of every week. And they were looking for people who had uh, access to public contracts, of which at that time I was one. The local authority people uh, having to meet targets and having to get production were facing a construction industry and the contracting industry of which McAlpines were one, Langs were another, Costains were another, Wimpies were another. Uh, Wimpies used to be in here every day. I can't remember offhand the name of the guy. But his full-time job was entertaining uh, and meeting local authority people. And then they also had the uh, perks, the uh, test matches. Wimpy's always every test match series used to have a marquee on the rugby side of the ground at Leeds. There were tickets to Ascot if you wanted to go, the boxes at Ascot. There were the precious Friday centre court tickets at Wimbledon. T. Dan Smith succumbed to another variety of perk by joining John Poulson, the corrupt architect. Together they climbed aboard the industrialised building bandwagon, which by now had built up a momentum of its own. The systems on offer were so complicated that only the contractors and their engineers understood them. The controls and checks that councils normally exercised were almost useless. The contractor's package deal was everything. The contractors were allowed to employ the architects, the quantity surveyors and the engineers and sell them to the local authority. That's what a package deal was. But the architects, uh, if you like, they were like doctors protesting about witch doctors and allowing the witch doctors to practice. They were allowing contractors to organize the architectural and professional people to sell to the local authorities and themselves weren't prepared to do it. And so the contractor, in fact, was the designer, the uh, producer of the materials, and the supervisor of the job. Faced by the contractors' newfound powers and by the government's massive subsidies, many councils felt they were being made offers they couldn't refuse. Nottingham Council agreed to build two huge developments, costing £6 million. I can remember very well taking them to committee and both schemes going through in something like about two minutes flat. The following scheme for something like a £2,000 £2, toilet block uh, was probably discussed for half an hour. But I was certainly... Um, it's uh, ingrained in my memory that these two schemes were disposed of so quickly uh, by committee. Not that I expected committee to do any more, but uh, I remember it well. Do you think that's a criticism of the, of the committee, or is it a reflection of the mood of the times? A reflection of the mood of the times, undoubtedly. Get it built as quickly as possible, then think. Princess Margaret's arrival in Woolwich marked a big day for the borough. The princess, accompanied by her husband, had come to perform the official opening of the new Tower Flats in the parish of St Mary. The ceremony was simple, the unveiling of a tablet recording the occasion. I was just starting my career in the 60s and I distinctly remember the mood of optimism, the amount of money that was available that was being spent on construction. New techniques were being tried. Um, there was a lot of talk about plot ratios and how much per place it was costing, how quickly people were going to be rehoused in these new blocks and uh, I think people were swept along by the euphoria of the time. Her Majesty, accompanied by the Duke of Edinburgh, arrives to open a new housing development in the Gorbals of Glasgow. She met members of the housing committee who were responsible for the new facelift. It was a real day to remember for the Johnston family. 
I think it was a general thing. I think uh, architects, uh, structural engineers, central government particularly, central government were very keen to encourage local authorities to build using uh, industrialised techniques so that uh, the main components could be made inside warm, comfortable factories. Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden made it a day they'll never forget. Sometimes it was only months after the excitement of the royal opening that the tenants found out what it was really like to live in system-built blocks. The princess and her Their flats ran with water from condensation inside and from leaks outside. Eventually, many councils gave up on piecemeal repairs. They began to evacuate the tenants and demolish the blocks. So far, 10,000 flats have been knocked down, some of them only 15 years old. Thousands more await the same fate. Who is to blame for the scale of the, the present problem? Well, it's very difficult, I think, to put blame on anyone. It is due to what we call innovation without development. Now, the pressure is on the designer, the architect, to provide the building that the client wants within the money that is available. Now, if he's going to try and do that, he wants to build it as cheaply as he can within the shortest possible time. So he's under pressure to innovate to try and achieve this. And the more you innovate without development, the greater are the risks. We have to compare this with other design situations like aircraft or products or cars where there is considerable research and development before they are mass produced. And this of course is reasonable because if you mass produce something and it fails, the consequences are enormous. Well, as far as buildings are concerned, most buildings except for housing are one-off. And if one fails, the consequences are less of a problem. But in mass-produced housing, as prefabricated housing, you may have thousands. And if there's a fault in them, there may be thousands of faults. And people didn't realize that unless you do the proper research and development, these enormous risks exist. The implication of that is really that the system building blocks mm -hmm. were a means of, were tested out on local authority tenants? Well, yes. I mean, the, the early examples were really, I suppose, the, the development situation of let's build some and see what happens. But uh, that's a very uh, costly way of actually uh, undertaking development. It's a very unfortunate way for the tenants as well, isn't it? Very, yes. The tenants, they were and are uh, victims of circumstances which were abominable. I spent three years in prison in conditions that were as good as some of the ones that they were put to live in. They were never, ever designed multi-storey flats for families. They were never designed to throw hundreds of people together, close in proximity, block to block, without open space. They were not designed for those purposes, and the fact that they were used for them is responsible for so much human misery that I thank the Lord that I had nothing to do with any of that kind of system building. What do you think they were designed for? Making money, and they made money in abundance. It was the best time that the contracting industries ever had. But the real dangers of system building are only just beginning to emerge. Many were built like houses of cards. The blocks have no central frame, Instead, their whole strength rests on the bolts and fixings between the concrete panels. As councils demolish their blocks, they're finding that in many cases, those connections are just not there. While well, some of the joints are barely jointed together, um, if they should have been held on by three or four inches, some, in some of the places they're probably one inch or two inch. Uh, with the slightest movement of the walls, and the floors, it causes 
Um, a collapse. I just uh, am amazed um, at what is found when we examine these buildings today, sometimes. Um, I uh, think that I could go beyond uh, bolts and fixings of that kind. Uh, we have found uh, serious deficiencies of um, the knitting of reinforcement. But we have been astounded to find how often uh, that reinforcement was never knitted together. It required, I think, an intelligence or uh, a sense of care that uh, was often missing on sites. One of the main attractions of system building was the contractor's claim that the blocks could be put up quickly by unskilled labour. It was all part of the design of the system, and to get the flats built more quickly, the contractors used piecework and bonus schemes. The faster you put the bolts in, the quicker you got them up, and the more everyone earned. If the bolt didn't fit into the bolt hole, what used to happen? Well, you probably get one or two, and uh, if you got a couple in, uh, that would sort of hold it as this assumed, and uh, that was it. In terms of the sort of crucially important bits, like where you know one panel's meeting another, and you've got bolts and you've got fixings that are meant to hold those panels in position, how often was that work done properly? Not very often. It varies from job to job, but. Um, not very often. I dare say if you went back now and dug some cement out, you'd find holes there where the bolts should be. I mean, when, when that... See, it was quite a common thing. I mean, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't unusual. I mean, who's going to bother putting four bolts in when you get away with two? It's... If you couldn't get them in, sometimes they'd walk in. Another time you'd have to spend anything up to 20 minutes, half an hour to get them in. If you wanted to avoid spending that half hour, what was the alternative? Cut them off. What proportion of bolts were missing and what proportion were put in? I would say about 80% uh, were missing and about 20% put in. That was your view after sort of spending a couple of years being in a very good position to see what was going on? Yes, yes. I mean, now that these buildings are being uh, demolished, like the, ones we like the one behind you, uh, the engineers are finding that a very large proportion of those crucial bolts and ties are not in position. Does that mean you were not doing your job properly? I would imagine that somebody wasn't doing their job properly if the bolts were not there. Then, in the first instance, the contractor wasn't doing his job properly because that's what he's paid to do. And secondly, the supervision that the contractor is employing is supposed to be seeing to the same thing. But at the same time, I would say that the clock works as a responsibility. If the structural uh, security of the whole thing is determined by every bolt being in and being tightened up properly, the answer is you'd have to have a very high degree of site supervision. Because, you see, if a man on site finds that the bolt doesn't go in because the hole that was cast in situ doesn't line up with the hole in the prefabricated, he's not going to stop and make it fit he'll just ignore it and press on because he's under pressure of speed of construction. As you talk to your sort of workmates and things, I mean, it was just common knowledge that the fixings and the bolts were not going in as they should be. Oh, yeah, it was a joke. It was a joke. The joke is wearing rather thin for the two and a half thousand tenants living in this large system-built complex in Hume, Manchester. Their flats are plagued with damp and the side of this large concrete walkway recently fell off. Council engineers then began to examine a number of flats and found that many of the bolts meant to be holding the large gable panels in position were not there. Anticipating there might be some problems with the new systems, the government had set up the National Building Agency in the early 1960s. One of its main jobs was to check that the blocks were being properly assembled. Its managing director was Cleve Barr, a long-standing advocate of industrialised building methods. If you found examples of, um, of bolts or and nuts and things, fixings not being done, I mean, mm. shoddy workmanship on a site. Yes. 
Did you report that sort of yeah, thing? Yes, yes, we did find that, and the uh, firms concerned would say they were staffing up the supervision and correcting it. It couldn't happen again, sort of thing. What was your next step if they said that? Um, well, within the capacity of trying to cope with uh, an enormous number of work going on, we would look at it again if that were possible. There were no sanctions you could impose? None at all. None so, at all. So the watchdog role was really a very hollow one, wasn't it? Yes, it was. A few years ago... The absence of a proper watchdog during the assembly of the system blocks was especially crucial. As each floor was completed, the connections and metal straps between the panels that were to hold the whole building together were sealed over by concrete being poured into the joints. Industrialised building methods are as expensive as bricks and mortar. Today, the only way to discover what is missing is to hack out that same concrete. Sometimes the buildings may start that process themselves. Tenants in this block in Hammersmith, West London, have reported cracks opening up between the walls and floors. We asked the former president of the Institute of Structural Engineers, Tom Ackroyd, to look at the problem. Yes, well, what, what we have here is the um, concrete being broken out to show or not show, as the, as the case may be, where there should be any fixings and straps. There should be straps connecting the uh, panel to the floor. Simple straps, not very large or complicated, but just enough to hold the panels in. They are missing. Certainly we know that um, in other flats there are straps missing, which uh, straps that uh, should come out to hold the, uh, the panels in. And since there aren't straps in more than one place, it suggests that there could be a number of places where straps ought to be and they're not. What in fact is holding that wall panel in position? It's probably the, uh, there should be a connection, a bolted connection, um, which is a hidden connection. The problem with the system, you see, from the point of view of that we're doing now is checking it, is to find the, the bolts and the connections. You can't get at the bolts and connections. You can't see them. So you uh, can't assure yourself if you're inspecting the, uh, the building, yet, yes, they're all right. That's the worrying part of the whole problem. Now, since these things were made in a factory, and since the contractors or the people who made them told us with great pride that an 18-foot panel made in their moulds would be accurate to plus or minus three millimetres, it never occurred to us that these bushes would not in fact fit over the boats. But it's perfectly clear now from what we hear, what's been found, that in fact they didn't always. Now, I don't know why this is so. The panel didn't come made properly. Uh, for instance, uh, two-ton concrete floor slabs that had, uh, was supposed to sit on six inches probably sat on an inch, something like that. There should have been a six-inch overlap. That's right. And in some cases, there was as little as an inch. Uh, any movement at all, and, uh, you know, they would just collapse. Well, there were panels that arrived on the site with the reinforcing bars too proud against the wall of the concrete. What happened to those panels? Well, some of them were rejected by us and then we were told they, they'd been passed at the work, so they were to be used. Was it ever explained to you that it was important that the metal was kept away from the surface? Yes, I think we were told that it was important but time was an important factor and if there is a skip load of concrete hovering over your head and some of the uh, plastic isn't in place then you go ahead and lower the skip down and pour the concrete. The results of this slapdash approach to the making of reinforced concrete is now showing up in blocks of flats across the country. Rainwater penetrates the walls and wherever the metal reinforcement is too near the surface, it rusts, expands, and forces off large pieces of concrete. In some cases, the whole structure is beginning to crumble. The problem of the reinforcement rusting and uh, chunks of concrete about so big uh, coming off blocks of 
uh, properties. It's a problem even on a low-rise block, a block that's only three or four storeys high. If you're talking about blocks this size falling off the outside uh, of tall tower blocks, 12, uh, 13 storeys up, often in high winds when they become dislodged, then uh, it's a very serious problem. How often did panels come that weren't the right size or shape or didn't have the right things projecting out of them? Oh, it's difficult to say if any of them came the right shape or the right size. Uh, You'd almost say that more came the wrong size than the right size. I'd almost say that all of them came the wrong size. For three 12 story blocks of flats at Rugby, the precast concrete. This promotional film, which shows a block being built by the Bison system, is a unique record. Unbeknown to the cameraman, he was filming damaged panels being fitted into the building. It's dropped into its place to fit like a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. But that wasn't all. Council engineers have now discovered that much of the metal reinforcement supposed to knit the panels together was not put in by the workers on the site. It has cost the council more than half a million pounds per block just to make them safe. To lay out a factory, in other words. Altogether, more than 50,000 flats were built using the bison wall frame system. As with all the other systems, a series of factories was set up to produce the large panels. These were then placed one on top of another to make the outside walls of the blocks. The structure of those panels was simple. Two layers of concrete separated by insulating material and held together by metal ties. What we have found in Birmingham is that in some situations the number of ties that should exist um, aren't there and also that in many situations the wrong material has been used for the ties. We've had to bolt back already um, a number of panels where we felt that there were so few ties that we were in a risk situation. Um, the reason for that is simple. We are the authority that had two panels fall from our high-rise blocks. Um, and when that happens, it's a horrendous thing when you have a, um, a block of concrete, which is something in the order of three metres by, by four metres, falling down from the tenth floor. Um, the obvious scare and concern that creates is considerable. Although it doesn't affect the structure, it clearly, in fact, could kill someone. Using a special electronic scanning device, Birmingham Council has secretly surveyed the panels in all their bison blocks. They found that 11,000 were secured by ties made of the wrong metal. A further 3,500 had less than half the ties they should, and 83 had nothing holding them on at all and were being kept in position by their own weight. Other cities have the same problem. In Glasgow, a panel weighing two tonnes fell from the fifth storey of this bison-built block. In an attempt to reassure their tenants, the council is bolting back all the panels. Decorative facings of factory-made mosaic are laid onto concrete walls to relieve the monotony. The problem of bad workmanship in the construction of panels was not confined to bison. The National Building Agency sent inspectors to many factories making parts for the systems. The output of the ten men operating the Often we the go to a factory and find that the uh, insulation, which is supposed to be in the middle of a sandwich panel, was floating on top, or the steel was too near the surface, or something like that. One would report it to the management, and they would say that they were correcting it. We made confidential reports to the Ministry on most of our visits, and so forth. Now, if those reports were adverse, what then happened? Well, the people concerned were told and told to improve it. And then were there checks to see if they had? Um, well, as I say, the supervision of a contract was between the authority, which theoretically should have had a clerk of works in the factory as well as on the site. But there just weren't enough skilled staff. Uh, and I'm afraid... A lot of it was taken for granted, rather. When systems arrived on the scene, did you understand them? I was aware of what the system involved, but uh, I couldn't say that I was perfectly uh, knowledgeable on that particular type of construction, no, because it was a change from the traditional type of construction that I was used to. I mean, given that this was an untried and untested type of building, given that the workers were on peace rates mm. and bonuses, the lack of site supervision is, was clearly a crucial factor in things going wrong. Oh, I think this is true. Um, 
and I think this applies everywhere, that, uh, you know, defects we find now to a large degree are due to such supervision as should have been found. But, you know, who is going to pay for this intensive amount of site supervision, you see? I think there's another problem, and that is the, the men on the site don't necessarily know the consequences of what they're doing. You see, I mean, if they miss something out, they are not aware of the structural implications of missing it out. Did anybody ever explain to you that it was pretty important to, you know, follow the specifications closely? Well, this was explained, but everything can be explained. It doesn't necessarily say that unless somebody's standing over your back, it's going to be followed. Further evidence of what was allowed to go on during the 60s boom is supplied by the large Trowbridge estate in East London, built by the Seabus Moray system. Consulting engineers were called in after a torrent of complaints from the tenants. We asked them to do detailed structural investigations because we're worried about continuing problems of penetrating water in the buildings. And when they carried out the opening up, they found that the buildings were structurally dangerous. Certainly three of them were. As a result, we've had to spend urgently a million pounds on works to stabilise these three blocks to make them safe. When we looked at the drawings of the original construction and looked at the results of the opening up, we found that the two did not, were not corroborated. That in fact the buildings were not built in accordance with the drawings. And also from the way in which they were built, that there'd been no adequate supervision on the site. Which led us to believe that all parts of these buildings were therefore suspect. The engineers hacked back the concrete and found in flat after flat that the metal bars meant to hold the panels onto the building were just not there. At what point does a building like this become unsafe? I don't know. It's a very difficult thing. One can't predict the life of a building like that. Uh, accidents could occur. They could be you know, literally almost instantaneous. All the thing could carry on and on, but there is no way of putting a life to it. It would be a guess. I think as an engineer you have to err if, if this is erring. If you don't know, you must caution and you must play very, very safe. And therefore you have to say no and assume that there's an imminent danger of, any, of something happening. This block had to be repaired and now that it has been repaired, I would say it is safe. Um, in your view, did the contractors know what was going on? I think so. I think so. As I say, I think they must have done. If they didn't, yeah, then they'd no right doing the job. Because that's, you know, purely bad supervision. Everybody knew what was happening. And uh, everybody just wanted to wash their hands of the responsibility of it. We've talked to some workers, and a number of workers on different sites. I mean, they say it was almost a standing joke amongst them that the work wasn't being done properly. Yeah. So the workers seem to know. They say, in fact, the contractors must have been aware of it. Yeah. Your men were aware of it. You were aware of it. Why wasn't something done? Well, I don't think anyone clearly saw the overall picture with that clarity. Uh, I mean, when you think that there were thousands of building sites and hundreds of uh, works over the country, we'd have had to have a very large organisation to do other than make spot checks on occasional firms. But you have said that you, you know, your staff in a sense had the occasional glimpse and oh, yes. what they saw yes. perturbed them. They yes. tell you, you pass that information but As far on. as we're concerned, that might have been 1% or something like that. And we passed any information like that on to the Ministry. We asked the Ministry if we could see those reports, not for our own benefit, but for that of councils anxious to know how their blocks were built. The Ministry acknowledged they had the files, but said they were still secret. But in terms of imposing some kind of standard nationally, you had no power? None at all. It seems to me that when one does get a situation like this, a situation like Roland Point, a situation like the buildings in Nottingham, like that large building complex in Leeds, which had to be blown down, then one, one is led to a conclusion that there is something suspect. This is obvious. And as a result, it seems to me that there should be, it would be silly not to have 
an investigation, a fundamental investigation, uh, followed up by possibly detailed investigation on a national scale of all building systems, precast building systems that have been used for this sort of thing. How urgently should that investigation well, be done? Well, it should be done now. I, you know, this is, this is a matter of an immediacy, I think. The system building boom lasted for 10 years. During that time, more than three quarters of a million flats were erected. Many of the contractors have since gone out of business. Others are involved in a welter of protracted lawsuits. Those that have been settled have been settled out of court. That way, there is no publicity. Fashion in housing has moved on, but more than two and a half million people have no choice but to go on living in system built blocks whose structural safety must now be regarded as questionable. While it is not justified to say that every block is dangerous, neither is it possible for any local authority to say that all their blocks are safe. They simply do not have the means of proving it. A house of cards, a tower of dominoes. There's a frightening accuracy in those descriptions provoked by the shock of canning... Five people died in the collapse caused by the 1968 explosion at Ronan Point. The government inquiry set up after the disaster recommended that gas should be removed from all system-built blocks. And the new electrical appliances were brought in. After 16 years of rapidly increasing fuel bills, many tenants cannot afford electricity and are throwing out those appliances. They're turning back to gas in the form of portable propane or colour gas cylinders. In my, uh, in my opinion, it's uh, like bringing in a bomb into the building because there's no way in which any of these buildings, not just this system, but any system build uh, construction, can resist an explosion from a Caligas type of cylinder blowing up. And if they're mishandled or badly handled, then that's always a possibility. I don't want to um, create alarm, but it is a dangerous um, material to have in a building of this kind or in any kind of uh, building like this where extensive damage could be caused not just to the the walls and the floors but to possibly um, uh, create a similar kind of situation to Ronan Point possibly so in fact having those sort of cylinders in flats like this is potentially lethal I believe it is potentially lethal and Why the, spend and the all the money of, if they're all right? And the risk of fire going from one flat to well, another. Well, they can't be safe. We're concerned about them falling down, not fire. Yes. Because they all right with was covering in A meeting of worried tenants in Hammersmith, West London. I'm right. Hammersmith housing officials, like their counterparts throughout Britain, are faced with an insoluble dilemma. Privately, they know that their tenants are at risk, but publicly, they have to try to defend the decision to leave them in their tower blocks. Just tell me one thing. When you've done this work, will you put your pen to paper and tell me that these flats Can are completely safe? I think it would be a very brave man who would be prepared to say that something was going to be safe for a longer period than 20 years. Why? Because who knows? Why are you wasting your money doing the work then? Because if they're not going to be safe, I don't want to live in them with my family. When they were built, want... everybody thought they were absolutely safe for but the 60 year got period. Doubts. Uh, shortly after they were built, Ronan Point fell down, so we went and had another look, and then we said it, they were going to be safe for 60 years after we were <coughs> strengthening. We've, we've found these problems which we never expected. So. I mean, I can't say that we won't find more problems that we, would, we don't expect now. We know a lot more now about these buildings than we did 20 years ago. Well, who's going to make this decision? Who, who's, how does this message get back that some of us want out? Who takes the message back? You, Dinah? Some of us just can't enough because enough. that will come in once more. The housing policy is that you put in for a transfer request. I cannot, I cannot turn round and see you can. We know you. Know, I really can't. like you. I think you're a frightfully nice girl. I'm going to put you in another nice little acquired yeah. property. Yeah. Do you think I can do that? Either these people are taken out of there while the work's done, and a complete survey is done of the whole block, yeah. or we admit the mistake that was made and pull them down, yeah. bring back the avenues. But 
but the avenues are beginning to have their problems too. As if coping with the problems of the 60s boom was not enough, councils are now finding trouble with the legacies of earlier housing crises. Over half a million non-traditional houses were built in the 40s and 50s. All were systems using concrete, which is now starting to rot. Leeds has um, a quite extraordinary problem in that it has a large number of system-built houses. Um, perhaps if I show you examples of the ones that we have. Waller houses, we have 500 of those. Duo houses, 800. Waits houses, 1,016. Unity houses, 273. Rima houses, 1,499. Livette Cartwright, 2,882. Cornish units, 327. There's problems with all of those houses, all of those types? Yes, to varying degrees. Some are only just starting to exhibit problems. Some, such as the Aries, we have serious problems with and we need to be moving quickly to uh, do something with them and make them structurally sound. We have problems on housing that was built in the 20s, the Boots, Bow Creek, Boswell houses of the 20s. We have problems in relationship to the houses built in the 30s. Not much happened during the 40s because of the war. Then we come to the 50s and the, the nightmares that exist with our concrete posts and beam structures. The 60s are a disaster area as far as we are concerned here in Birmingham with system built housing, with the, lots and lots of concrete being used, um, inadequate insulation. Very real problems for our tenants who are living in these properties. I do believe that there are blocks, that if a, uh, blocks of flats, that if action is not taken speedily, do, will provide a major risk uh, to the people who live in them in the future. We know that in the 40s and 50s there were half a million dwellings built, but the figure for the 60s and 70s is probably between three quarters of a million and a million. Is it possible to turn that into the number of people affected and say how many people are living in defective or potentially well, defective? Well, yes, I should think the number of people that are living in defective or potentially defective dwellings is probably up to six million. Can you put a cost of the total amount you'll be spending to remedy all these defects? Yes, the uh, estimated figure for Leeds City Council is £458 million. Pounds. And how much did you get last year from the government? We got um, from the government less than £8 million pounds to spend on capitalised repairs of the type we've talked about this morning. So you need more than 50 times that amount? We do. What will happen if you don't get it? Well. Clearly, uh, buildings will become progressively unsafe um, and we would have to vacate certain properties and either board them up or demolish them. With no alternative accommodation, many councils are desperately trying to remedy the defects in their system-built housing stock so that their tenants can go on living in them. A new industry has sprung up, offering methods of repairing the systems. Tower blocks hundreds of feet high are being completely recovered or reclad in new materials, guaranteed to prevent rain reaching the joints. When the housing department dealing with the Trowbridge estate in London were trying to solve the problem of water leakage, they were offered four different commercial systems to choose from. Can you tell me what happened when you tested the systems that had been suggested for use at Trowbridge? Well, in that case, the criterion was quite simple. The system would prevent rainwater crossing a small cavity and wetting the insulation, which was to be fixed on the outside of the blocks. And to our surprise, none of the systems tested uh, succeeded in doing this. Did the systems fail the test badly? Some of them did, some failed very badly, but uh, some were not so bad. They failed comparatively narrowly, but it would have been important. We were dealing with a three meter square panel, if you consider that area grossed up to the size of a, a high-rise block, then obviously it was serious enough. 
Are those systems being used by other local authorities? Well, so far as I know, yes, but whether they're being used in precisely the same form, I have no way of telling. The only way that you can repair the present industrialized systems, or virtually the only, only way, is by the use of other untried and untested remedial works. And so we're actually finding that there are now systems of repair coming in to repair the, uh, the systems built dwellings in, in the first place. And we already have evidence of some of those repair systems failing because they've been inadequately researched and evaluated. What sort of risks do you think there are from using systems that haven't been appraised properly? Well, uh, to take a very obvious one, there's the fire risk. And I, I think it's absolutely essential that anything that is being placed on or around an existing block should be considered very carefully in relation to a serious fire. There's the problem of weather tightness that we've already mentioned, where if water is dripping inside a system for years, it may make the situation much worse than it ever was before the, the cladding was placed. On the question of a fire risk, do you think that there are now systems being used which represent a fire risk? Frankly, yes. Would you be prepared to name them? No. <laughs> when professionals now tell us that the remedial work being done on high-rise blocks is adequate and will solve the problem, should we trust them? <laughs> if I say yes, will you call me complacent? <laughs> I won't take everything they say with a pinch of salt. It's very difficult to, as, a, as an amateur, uh, my, my job is to look after tenants and manage housing. I'm not an engineer or a surveyor. It's difficult as an amateur to criticise professionals. But the only way I can respond to the question is to say that the calming and impressive manner of these well-heeled professionals who argue that these buildings are safe or can be made safe is exactly the same kind of information and argument that was put by the very people who designed them in the first place. Those people, those experts, built these buildings that have now been shown to warrant £33 million worth of repairs. That's £33 million worth of a professional mistake. And the cost of that has to be met because the builder went bankrupt and the professionals responsible can't be nailed for it. The cost of that has to be found by ratepayers and rentpayers. And rentpayers in this borough are ratepayers too. And the cost falls back on the tenants. And on this estate, a large number of the tenants are unwaged, below the poverty line, and elderly people. And if you're asking me to accept the word of people that built this rubbish, and to accept their arguments for remedial works and to say that because they're professionals I must believe it. I'm asking you to believe me that a 33 million pound mistake is evidence for the amateur to argue that you reject the so-called professional arguments. You listen to the tenants, you look with your own eyes and you use the evidence of those observations and the horror stories that people tell you of the problems they've had with flooding and defects and deficiencies and you are guided by them and not by so-called professionals who frankly I don't believe have a clue about what they're doing here. Do you think that many of the men who worked on the buildings actually now live in them? I wouldn't say any of them live in them, or any of them would have ever lived in them. Why not? Well, they know the risk and the danger. <laughs>